Assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan. Shukran for joining us on a very special episode of A Note the Light. As it is Disability Awareness Month, we've decided to focus most of our attention on the challenges that children and people with a disability face. Our first story takes place in Durban, where the Ibn Mas'ud Center is doing amazing work with young learners. A 2014 report found that nearly 3 million South Africans live with a disability. Despite constitutional protection and legislation, people with disabilities are sadly still excluded from many facets of life. Having a child that's challenged, it's not easy. You actually have to do the work of 10 kids for one child that's challenged. And these ladies go out of their way to ensure that their kids get the best education, even whether it's at home or at Ibn Masood. The Ibn Masood Center of Excellence first opened its doors in 2008 as a project of the Al Ansar Foundation. They recognized a great need in the community for a school that would cater to the physically challenged. We started off with four learners only in that year. Obviously starting a new project is very stressful, you're not knowing whether it's going to be successful, whether we'll even be able to accomplish whatever we need for those four learners. You know, after the first year, after we looked at the progress that we've seen in these kids, that today we are sitting with 32 learners. The Allen Sard directors, specifically our chairman and the others, go out fundraising during the month of Ramadan for Ibn Masood. Uh, I think out of the 32 learners, we only have about 29 learners that can afford fees. And that too, not the complete fees. So remember, therapy is very expensive. And uh, one of the reasons for having the therapist in-house is that because we provide them with the premises, then they give us a very discounted rate in regards to therapy. Ibn Mas'ud is one of very few Islamic special education schools in the country with a focus on little ones between the ages of 4 and 10. Ibn Mas'ud is one of the schools with an Islamic ethos, although we do take learners from different faith backgrounds. And uh, having said that, you know, if a child goes to any other school, he's not given the Islamic ethos that we have. And uh, we do turn down children every day. You get this request all the time, but uh, because of the age limit as well, if you notice our kids are very small, if you take them from 12 and above, then the whole ball game changes and you, you need to get separate educators. Remember, they are are not that kids anymore, they are now young adults. From hearing and speech impediments to autism and muscular cognitive disabilities, no child is turned away. We start off with the madrasa and then we have uh, the remedial one, the remedial two, we have a stimulation and then we have an autistic unit and then it comes with the uh, speech therapy, we have a physio, we have an in-house OT and we have a coach that comes, and physio as well. Learners are assessed and given individual curriculums. The centre provides state-of-the-art facilities comparable to the best special needs institutions. I think about 50% of the learners are educable. And our aim is to make sure that they reach that level and they go back into mainstream. And every year we have at least two or three learners. And I think that's a major achievement for us to know that we have accomplished our goal for this year and now this child is ready to go back into mainstream. Well, it's a lot of work. The remedial teachers have to work very hard and there's lots of work that the parents themselves have to do to actually help these children along to get into mainstream. The school started with only four pupils and today over 30 blessed souls are accommodated here. Ibn Mas'ud provides a sanctuary for learning and development despite the challenges faced by these young learners. They assist the differently able to lead a lifestyle that is healthy, happy and productive. It is important that we continue to support people with disabilities as their rights are enshrined in our constitution. Molana Zakaria Philander is up next with this week's Q&A. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Maulana Zakaria Falanda. Welcome to Q&A on Anur the Light. Our first question was emailed to us and asks, what is the ruling on eating halal food from people of the book? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, wa ta'amu alladhina utu al-kitaba hillu lakum, wa ta'amukum hillu lahum. That the food of the people of the book are permissible for you, and your food is permissible for them. By people of the book, the Quran is referring to Jews and Christians who adhere to their own scripture. There is absolutely no problem in Islam for Muslims to eat food prepared by people of the book that are halal. The next viewer would like to know, if Islam is considered a religion of peace, why is there so much conflict amongst Muslims? Indeed, there is conflict in the Middle East and there is conflict in other places on this planet. This is by no means an indication that Islam is a religion of violence. Islam is indeed a religion of peace. In fact, in no other time in the history of, of man have we seen so much suffering, which means the world is more in need of Islam and what it preaches with regard to peace than at any other time in its history. If people, and Muslims particularly, adhere to the teachings of the Qur'an and the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, in a manner that they should adhere to it, we will find stability, we will find peace, and we will find harmony amongst all people. Our final question was sent in via Facebook. A man has asked for my daughter's hand in marriage. She is 18 years old, and I do not feel that she is ready. How do I treat this situation? It is important for the parents to look into the interests of their children, especially their young daughters who want to get married. I think it is important that we know that there are certain criteria for marriage that a man has to possess before he is a suitable suitor. One of those things is that he needs to be able to be financially stable in order to uphold the family. He needs to be able to provide housing and he needs to be able to provide an adequate lifestyle that the lady that he wants to get married to is used to. If he possesses these criteria and he is a man of upstanding character and, and, and also his religious outlook is one that draws him close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is a suitable person to give your daughter's hand to in marriage. If he fails in any of these criteria, you can ask him to step up to the plate and you can review the decision perhaps after some time. That brings us to the end of this Q&A. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. The El Munira School in Roshni, Johannesburg has been running since 1991 and was started by three nurses who wanted to see to the needs of children with disabilities. We got to spend the day there and found some incredible and caring people who serve only for the pleasure of Allah. The Al Munira School for Handicapped Learners is the result of the shared vision of three nurses and a teacher. Recognizing a need to provide a unique service for differently abled children in Roshni and neighboring communities. Al Munira is a special needs center catering for learners with special needs and disabilities. And uh, it's an NGO run by the uh, the community as far as funds are concerned? Well, the centre started in around 1991 by three nurses that felt the need for a school to take care of children with special needs, either mentally or physically challenged kids. We were fortunate enough that the City Bank Council, there's a local council, provided this premises for us, which used to be the clinic and they converted part of the clinic and they gave us half of it to run as a centre for special needs. At first, the school ran on a shoestring budget, but today is thriving as an early intervention facility, providing a stimulating and nurturing environment for children with all kinds of learning disabilities. Another challenge we have is finding the right type of special needs people to come and help us in terms of OTs, speech and hearing therapists. There's a great need for this type of, of uh, special, uh, special training teachers for us. Because funding is a problem, we cannot afford to hire them on a full-time basis. So obviously those are one of, the, one of the biggest challenges at this present moment. 
Al Munira serves 14 children, offering classes ranging from academics, art and gardening to swimming lessons. Classes are designed to cater to the individual learning abilities of each child, ensuring that their full potential is realized. We've got secular, uh, literacy and numeracy life skills. Uh, we do a bit of, uh, we do fine motor development, where we, where we work with um, beadwork, with um, puzzles and different forms of fine motor aspects, right? And then we also have introduced lately was the Pilates and the swimming. We start off in the morning by thanking God for allowing us to be around in, for today and hopefully for the next few years to come. And then they start off, we have a rehabilitation class where we teach hand-eye coordination, small muscle memory movements, and then they have rest time. After rest time, we, we offer them a lunch where they can have a meal for the day. Certain children come from previously disadvantaged backgrounds and really they don't come, they don't have food. So our center provides food for them as well. Then we have a gardening area where they plant vegetation and it just gives them a, self, a sense of self-belonging where they take this vegetation and we are, people come and buy from it. And little perks they get from it, we give it back to the center and it allows us to keep the center going. When Yusuf was born, we were looking for a facility where we could send him for, you know, for his first year OT. And uh, a few years just after he was born, Al Munira started and really they've done a wonderful job with him and Yusuf enjoyed the school. He really loved it. As a non-profit organization, the school relies on funds generously provided to them by the community. Through a series of fundraising initiatives, the school has expanded to include a dining and resting area as well as wheelchair-friendly facilities. All the funds we receive is totally dependent from the community and our fundraising events. There's quite a few members on the board that do the fundraising efforts for the school, where they have a golf day and a concert now and again. And then we have school fees that the children pay on a monthly basis, which is a very minimum what they can afford. They do a wonderful job. I think they give a lot uh, of their own time, and uh, we do not thank them enough. I think they do a wonderful job. Life is a blessing no matter the circumstances, a sentiment proven by the Almanera teachers, parents and students alike, taking each day as evidence of Allah's mercy, sustenance and love. Alhamdulillah, it gives me great pleasure to see that Muslims in South Africa are really stepping up and serving their country proudly. This week's travel segment takes us to the tiny Dorby of Prince Albert in the Western Cape. On the southern edge of the Great Karoo, you'll find a small town named Prince Albert, where Karoo lamb, olives and homemade cheeses are local delicacies. Probably in one of the most beautiful spots in South Africa, you in Prince Albert. We milk these beautiful girls behind here, who basically are part of the family. We know them by name, we know them personally. They each have a personality. Their milk gets recorded twice a day, so if anyone's off color, we know immediately when there's a problem. We supply people with milk. Gay's Dairy is a household name over here, and it's easy to see why. Local businesses are greatly supported. Fresh produce is also on hand, and it's not just milk that is famous at Gay's Dairy. To make cheese, various types of cheese, and uh, to make a mozzarella, I make a gala type that we call a Prince Albert Royal. Uh, I make a more cheddar type that I call a Prince Albert Regal make yogurt. Visitors can even book a tour of the dairy farm and see exactly how these beloved cows are milked, how cheeses are aged and even get to taste some yummy yogurts. Founded in 1762, there's no doubt that Prince Albert has a rich history to tell. The Francie Pena Museum is a great stop if you're wanting to find out more about the people who first lived here and many other interesting facts about Prince Albert. The Francie Pena Museum was started by Francie Pena who started collecting when she was a child. She was born in 
97. And it's the best place to start a visit when you come to Prince Albert because here you get the whole background of the town and how it started and how it developed. As with many South African towns, Prince Albert grew with the discovery of gold. The authentic Cape Dutch, Karoo and Victorian buildings give a bit of insight into the people who lived here. It's got a very big variety. It's a cultural and a natural history museum. So there's a lot of furniture, paintings, uh, old organs, dining room tables, uh, kitchenware, uh, cutlery, crockery. But then we also have uh, the history of the Swartberg Pass, Meyerkspoort, Gamkaskloof. We have a room about the Bushmen and McCoy people. So it's a very wide variety. And we also have a fossil display one because the Karoo is famous for its fossils. Fascinating artifacts such as clothing, jewelry and old books were collected by Franzi Pinar and remain preserved here to this day. Perhaps there's one picture in this museum that's special to me, the royal visit in 1947. The train didn't stop in Prince Albert because we're not on the rail, on the main line. Uh, but it stopped at Kreutfontein, about 45 kilometers from here. The principal of the colored school, Mr. Johannes, he took his pupils to greet the king and the queen. He took them a basket of succulents from the Karoo. Very touching. So that, that picture stands out for me here in our museum. Farming and touring are the two main activities in Prince Albert, and the Swart River olive farm certainly gives you a taste of both. We planted the first olive trees in 1973. One evening, I didn't know what to do, so I prayed and uh, I asked guidance from God. And when I opened my Bible, I read about the fig trees, the vineyards, and the olive trees being passed down from the fathers to the sons. And we saw that as a guidance to do what to do, which, which direction to go. As producers of extra virgin olive oil, one can come and see the process of how the oil is extracted from the olives and even taste it along the way. When people come out to the farm and they would like to, we take them on a tour, we show them where we process the olives, where we bottle the olives, we show them the olive press and tell them how the olive press works. The olive press, of course, is very new technology, so the oil that we make is a very good quality oil. On the farm, we offer the coffee shop and the facility where we can do olive tastings and people can actually taste the olives and have the opportunity to decide what they want to buy. And we also serve light meals. From bottled olives to olive paste and pestos, you don't want to miss your chance to stock up and learn all about the beautiful olives of Prince Albert. I've heard from the crew that the cheese from Gay's Dairy really is as good as they say. For those heading to Cape Town during December, Prince Albert is just off the N1 and a beautiful stopover. It's the end of this week's show. So until next week, same time, same place, I'm Mara Mukwanda. Salam Hantle. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>